Here at Visit with Spirit, we are not out to prove or disprove anything. We are not asking anyone to believe or not believe. We are asking that you, the listener, are compassionate to what our guests have experienced, whether or not you believe, that you respect their journey as we help them on their path of healing. Welcome to Visit with Spirit. We're here to listen to stories from those who have had a paranormal experience, as well as to help them process, understand, and feel good about it. Welcome, souls and spirits, to another episode of Visit with Spirit. I'm your host, JD. And I'm your host, Lisa. Today, we are going to be exploring the dream world. Lucid dreams, dream interpretation, and dream visitations. So where should we start, Lisa? You know, I think just even like everybody dreams, not everybody remembers them. Some people say they don't dream, but I think they do. They just don't remember them. That's the cool thing to actually start with is the styles and how everybody dreams differently, which I didn't know. Uh, My dreams are full color, full sound, like a movie. Yes. I didn't know some people dreamed in black and white. I didn't know some people had sound. Some people don't. So I think just... Considering the fact that everybody dreams differently, but everybody dreams is such a cool concept. Yes. You know, and I think something that we've talked about before is the fact that we all assume, and it's not just dreaming, but we all assume the way we get information is the same. So whether it's intuitiveness or your spiritual gifts, or in this case for today's topic, dreaming, we all assume that how we get it is how everybody gets it. Mm-hmm. You brought up something about black and white versus color. So not everybody dreams in color. Like you, I dream full color. Sometimes I dream in black and white. Most of the time it's full color. But if you have somebody who perhaps has color blindness, they're not going to be dreaming in color, Mm -hmm. which that's something on this first topic, talking about how different impairments or different abilities are going to change, again, how you intake information from the world. Because that's really what dreaming is, isn't it? Like, it's us processing our daily lives. For the most part, we'll get into when a dream isn't a dream later. It's our brain's way of processing all the trauma and the drama that we go through on a daily basis. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I always wonder too, if For some of us, again, when the, you know, when is a dream not a dream, does it allow us to process what happened that day or does it prepare us for the next day? Oh, good question. I'm one of those people that I have dreams about work. I have dreams about, you know, very mundane stuff. But I actually knew somebody who (laughs) her husband actually used to dream with Larry the Badger. And he and Larry the Badger would go on adventures. And I'm like, why can't I have dreams like Larry the Badger? Like mine are so mundane. Again, like I said, it's what I've gone through through the day. It kind of just, you know, maybe a different scenario of what really happened. Mm -hmm. Pretty mundane stuff for the most part. Not all the time. We're going to get into that. Um, So it's kind of like real life. Like I think real life, most of your days are pretty uneventful. And then you have some surprises thrown in. That's a really great analogy, is the mundaneness of most dreams is probably why we don't remember a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, our brain processed what needed to be processed. There were no big surprises. And so we woke up and it kind of melted into, you know, waking life. Mm -hmm. Now, something that came into my awareness recently, and I, I wish I could credit where I got this information probably a YouTube video or an interview, but talking about how we assume that what we get is the norm and what everybody gets and going back into the idea of different impairments is that people who have visual or hearing difficulties, 
may not, if, if they, let's say somebody is, um, has a visual difficulty, so they're not perceiving their world visually, they're perceiving it orally through the ears, through the mouth, or they are, maybe they don't hear, but they perceive their world visually. That is absolutely going to impact their dreams, especially if it's something that if, if they've been living this way from childhood, from a very early age. I have heard of some people who lose their sight later in life, but because they lived most of their life or even early life taking or inputting this third dimension. And I, I know I'm speaking in, in a little bit higher terms right now, but really our experience of the physical world is all in our mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's our mind processing. So if somebody was able to initially process their world, both visually and orally, orally, then they are going to have dreams with both sound and visuals. Maybe not all the time, might be a mix, but people who've been from birth who are missing one of their senses, that's not going to incorporate into their dream because it's simply just not a way they processed the information that's around them. In fact, there is this great, they're on both, I think, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, uh, What About Bunny? And she is a dog. <laughs> yep. And they've started talking. They use like those little press buttons. And I forget which episode it was or which video it was, but it kind of came out that she had heard in her dream because they call it night talk. <laughs> And like, I think it was like, basically, what are you talking about at night, Bunny? Because I think she was barking or sleep talk. And it was like, heard a stranger, smelled something. But very rarely does Bunny refer to seeing something. So it's usually hearing or or smelling, which I think is is really interesting. And that might have been what launched me onto the topic of like looking into it more. Because it's like, oh. Oh, like, hmm, you know, always wondered what animals dreamt about. That was kind of a cool little insight into their mind, but it also helped me rethink how as humans dream and process their thoughts at night. So I thought that was pretty interesting. It does make sense, though, because I think dogs, because of their protective nature, by the time they see something, it's a little too late. So they do rely on their hearing and their smell before they would see something. So that actually does kind of make sense for for bunny to not actually see something right away that does make sense that's really interesting now have you ever in your dreams had physical sensations yes sometimes i'll i'll try to to run and i can't because my legs asleep or something and then i'll find out that it is in real life you know so i don't know if that's what you're referring to but there's been times where I'll wake up and I'm still a, a little half asleep and I can feel like something either sitting next to me or I don't, I don't know. Like, and it's hard sometimes to, I, like I said, I don't know if I'm going in the right direction here. I think what you were experiencing, it sounds like a possible visitation. Yes. Where in some of my dreams, I, I do definitely get that physical feeling of running where I wake up panting or I physically feel, I don't know if this makes any sense, but I physically feel the emotions. So I'm both emotionally feeling oh, the emotions, okay. yep. but then I'm also physically feeling or I'll feel like I'm falling. Like I have the sensation of I'm mm -hmm. falling off of something, but I'm not Yeah. like I wake up and it's like, oh, or like, I'll feel like there's a physical block in front of me and I'm pushing and pushing kind of like you were running. Mm -hmm. Um, and, or like, I'm trying to throw a punch. It's like my hand just, and it just feels like everything is in slow motion or yes. like there's some force like pushing back. So maybe it's not a physical like touch, but it's the sensation of my body not being able to move as it would in waking life. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. All of a sudden, like you've forgotten how to walk and you just accept it. You're like, oh, I can't run like I, 
like you know like this is yes. you know part of your dream when, where you totally just accept everything that's going on you're like oh there's a pink bunny in the tree he's cute and you keep walking you know? so it's really bizarre but to go back to the physical sensations i don't know if it's because because of my clear audience my ears i tend to be you know hyper focused on on hearing if i hear a sound in real life it will apply in my dream which is very interesting because if something falls off a shelf and makes a sound in real life, in my dream, it will actually preempt that sound. So something in my dream will also fall and make the same noise at the same time, which I always find yes. interesting. It's not like I hear the sound and then I, in my dream, I try to reconcile where that sound came from or what it was, but it will happen simultaneously. Like something falling in real life will fall in my dream and the same sound will you know, the sound will be applied to my dream, which I always found very, really weird that it happens at like the same exact time. That is really interesting. But actually, it, you talking about sound, you brought me into another and friends, I apologize if we're a bit meandering on this, because when you're talking about the dream world, let's face it, you meander in dreams. It's difficult to talk about the dream world without meandering a little bit. Yeah. So apologies for meandering. <laughs> I'll try to bring it back to the point, but um, you mm -hmm. were talking about sound and it reminded me of like being woken up to like a phone ringing or a buzzing of an alarm that I don't have in the house. So kind of like the physical sensations, I'm physically hearing something that startles me awake. Now, again, it could be overlapping into the spiritual that I'm, that I'm hearing. Cause I have heard physically heard spirits when I'm in that twilight state but this is like when I'm in deep dream state and I'll hear almost like the doorbell ringing or again the phone ringing or my alarm ringing but nothing in waking life is actually ringing when I'm actually awake have you ever experienced something like that I have like and once you said you get startled awake you're like it's real you go looking you actually like are like you look outside you're like did somebody really ring the doorbell and then you know, you try to find it, but there's also been other times where I'm in such a deep sleep, my alarm will go off and I'm looking at my phone and I'm like, why is it making that sound? And it's like, what? And I'm trying to, you know, so it's either, you know, I'm in such a deep sleep, I don't know where I am or something startles me awake. So it's really weird how you interpret physical sounds while you're asleep, but also how your brain makes you think that you're hearing something physically and you're asleep so it's it's weird how all your senses kind of get a little mashed up during sleep oh it is it is just bizarre it <laughs> it is absolutely it is the sensations or like when when you're looking at like a clock and like the numbers are wonky or you go to dial a phone and it's like your fingers don't quite know where to go in the dream mm -hmm. because it, nothing is in the spot that it should be in. Or you're in, this happens a lot where I'm in what very clearly is my home in the dream that was never my home, or at least not in this lifetime. Uh, so I don't know if, if perhaps there's some past life memories sneaking in there. But I was telling you about a dream a little while ago that I was living in Paris. Now, I've never been to Paris I've never had an urge, a little urge to go, but I, I've not seen enough where I'd be like, yes. And this is an apartment that I don't think exists because all the walls are glass. Remember that one, like where I couldn't like close the doors mm -hmm. and cause all like the walls were like these glass panel doors into the next person's apartment. And it was like, there's enough stuff cluttering it that you couldn't see everything. And I'm thinking, what is happening? My dog kept escaping through these doors. I'm like, kept trying to lock them and people kept coming in. It's like, what is happening? I'm like, I'm locking these doors and more people are coming in. It's like, where are you coming from? <laughs> Leave my home. And it's like, and then you wake up. It's like, I've never lived there mm -hmm. ever. No house, no building I've ever seen ever looked. So it's weird. Like what your brain does to <laughs> to the physical objects or everyday objects in the dream world you know you were talking about something you you said a statement about how we just take for granted that this is how it is and we accept it mm -hmm. which 
is a great lead into the topic of lucid dreams, which yes. you are far more the expert in mm-hmm. than I am. So I'm very interested to hear in how you got started in lucid dreaming, why, and if you have any tips or tools for our listeners to kind of start their lucid dreaming journey. Absolutely. Because a lot of what you said actually lent itself to, you know, moving on to the subject as well of lucid dreaming because you can't use a phone and because when you try to read something, it it looks weird. So most of the times we just accept the dream state. We don't realize that we're dreaming. We just kind of, you know, like I said, you see the pink bunny in the tree and you think, oh, how adorable. Lucid dreaming is when you realize that you're dreaming and you start to control it a little bit. It can be difficult. Sometimes, you know, you want to take a vacation to the beach and you find yourself sidetracked and then you forget that you're lucid dreaming again. And so the control part doesn't last very long if you can. I know that there's some people, there's a particular artist and I can't remember his name. He's in, I believe he's from the UK, but he actually does lucid dreaming where he'll meet strangers in dreams and he'll have them draw a picture. And then when he wakes up, he'll recreate the picture. You can find him on Instagram. Whoa. Dave Green. Dave Green 5000. So he actually makes drawings in his lucid dreams and recreates the results when he wakes up. So a very cool account to follow. Just going to give a shout out to him because that, like I said, it's a great Instagram account to check out and to read about and learn about his process is really cool. I, I can't wait to go exploring. When we're done here, I'm probably going to go check check it out right away. <laughs> going back to how I started lucid dreaming, if you've heard our episode, The Scene World, you knew that I grew up in a haunted house. If you haven't listened to The Scene World, definitely check it out. And a lot of growing up in that house did include nightmares. I thought every kid had nightmares like I did. I was in my parents' room like two or three times a, a month. I'd run in there screaming. And, you know, my son, I think I can count on one hand how many nightmares he's had in his entire life. So one thing I had to learn was how to wake up from these. And there was a pattern where I was, I'd be attacked and I would start to realize that it was a dream. And there were times where I could wake myself up and times that I couldn't. And as time progressed, I started to learn a little bit more about lucid dreaming. And there were a few tricks that helped me to realize when I am lucid dreaming. And again, a lot of it is when you try to do something that you do every day and it's just not working. So, you know, there's always that old trick of, oh, pinch yourself and you wake up. Well, if you feel a physical sensation in your dream and you feel it, you're like, oh, well, I guess I'm not dreaming. So a lot of lucid dreaming has to happen during the day. You have to practice. So during the day, practice a few times a day Uh, trying to read something. If you try to read a page in a book, or I usually like logos on products because those are fairly well known and we can remember them. So I'll look at a product, I'll look away, and I'll look back. And if the image is the same, I know that I'm awake. And if the image has changed, I know that I am asleep. I was able to do that. I think I started that around 12 or 13. I figured out that trick, which was really cool. So sometimes even if it wasn't a nightmare, I could do that. And I was like, oh, I'm dreaming. And I think the first thing I'd always default to was I'm going to go fly around. And so I would get this running start and I would just start flying around my neighborhood. It was great. It's like, so I got to have a lot of fun. (laughs) But in regards to the nightmares, I would try to wake up and I would really struggle with trying to wake up. I'd be fighting I'd be yelling, I'd be cursing, and then I would wake up with such a jolt, like it would feel like I fell back. And it was such a rough way to wake up or I'd be gasping for air. And I started to realize that if this was, you know, what if this wasn't a dream? What if this was a, a like a paranormal attack in the middle of the night? Some of these things are attracted to fear and anger and negative energies, and it makes them stronger, which would explain why I would still have a difficult time even when fighting. So I've changed my tactic over the last couple of years. And if I know it's a dream and it's in a negative space, I'll start to sing. And I'm singing in this dream and I'll start to slowly, like the the scene almost starts to, to move back. 
I'm breathing better. I'm relaxed. And I wake up so gently. So that's kind of another way that I've figured out, like I said, over the years, how to get out of these nightmares that I always seem to still have to this day. They're not as common as I used to have. As long as I set the boundaries around my house, do regular cleansings, I'm okay. But you know, every once in a while, something sneaks in and I have to, whether it's just a dream or if it's an attack, I, I still treat it the same way. I still will, am I dreaming? Let's observe the situation, find my center, and I just start singing and it just seems to work for me. Now, you mentioned something about flying, which brought to mind astral travel. Mm. What would be the difference between astral traveling? Because a lot of times kids do this, even adults, without trying to or attempting to. And actually, one of the tricks of the daytime looking at the logo, looking back, is a very similar way that people train to purposefully astral travel. Would you say that lucid dreaming and astral travel are just different terms for the same experience? Or are they like parallel similar experiences? Or totally different? Yeah, I think lucid dreaming is different. I think that's just kind of controlling a little bit of the imagery, the energy, um, but it can lead itself to astral projection. You know, some of the things that you might see in your dreams, you might want to actually go see if you can get to that place in real life, see how accurate it is. I know that you know, now with the overhead satellite imagery of cities, towns, and neighborhoods, it's really easy to confirm if what you're seeing in your dream is accurate on a map. I'm pretty sure that I astral traveled as a kid when I was asleep. And occasionally, even now, waking up similar to how you're describing, like exhausted or panting, being able to fly, like I would not really fly, but more float for extended periods of times, like I would jump and I would be in places that were familiar, like in my neighborhood, but it wasn't lucid dreaming because I didn't have control over it. Or at least if I did, I wasn't aware that I had control. So it wasn't a purposeful lucid. I've only had like one moment where I thought, Hey, this is a dream. And then I woke up, you know, and that was accidental. And when I was younger, certainly not from, (laughs) from training, but it was a nightmare. And it was like, this is, this is awful and scary. And where am I? I'm like, wait a minute, this is just a dream. And then came right out of it. But astral traveling, it, it, when people come back, it feels very similar. Like you're falling back into your body. So I'm kind of wondering if these attacks were happening on the astral plane and then through your lucid dreaming techniques, because you were treating them the same, Mm -hmm you are able to take control of the situation where if somebody is accidentally astral traveling, they're not trained, it's just kind of happening, Mm -hmm. that they really kind of feel helpless in the same way you might feel in a regular dream. Like this is happening to me and I don't have any control over it. Mm -hmm. I wonder, like, as I'm listening to you, how much the, like where the lines are blurring there. Yeah, I've never thought of that. But I do know too that if you, fall asleep somewhere differently too than you don't usually like whether it's like if you're traveling or even if you take a nap on the couch I've actually done a lot of it's really weird like I can get one limb Mm -hmm. to astral travel like so I remember you know a few times I'll fall asleep on the couch and I know I'm half awake but I know I'm half asleep it's like my body feels very heavy but I can feel my arm next to me But at the same time, I can move my arm and I can touch the side of the couch. It's almost like I can feel two different limbs at the same time. And it's like, ooh. And that's, you know, again, I think we've talked about this before. I'm a little bit leery of actually going full out on astral projection. But just to have that, every time that happens, I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And I'm like, am I really awake or am I asleep? It's, It's like is this physical sensation because I'm actually able to get my astral arm out of my physical arm or like, you know, it's, it's so, it's just interesting. It's just really cool to to think about. See, I haven't had the need to purposefully astrally project because when I remote view, I kind of 
am astrally projecting, but only using my third eye, not my entire spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like I'm going through or I'm projecting just my third eye into the space, like a camera, kind of like, but not my entire self. And I've tried purposefully training to astral travel. And every time, like, right as I'm about to like break out, it's like, my, yep. <laughs> my, my need to control the situation comes sweeping back. It's like, nope, don't leave your body. Mm-mm, you need to stay here and take care of your earthly business. But astral travel can be quite addictive. Do you find, for some people, do you find it's that same sensation with lucid dreaming that like you just want to kind of get back to that place? Or is it really for you just out of self-defense? Uh, oh, for me, it can absolutely be addicting because it's so it's it's freeing. There's almost like, you know, I'm going to admit there's a bit of escapism to it. It's like watching a movie or reading a book. You can kind of like those old choose your own adventure books where you could you could pick what happens. And so, you know, there's times where during the week I really want to do a lucid dreaming session. But I'm like, well, I got to get up early for work. I can't can't spend all night dreaming like I'd like to. Um so I think that that's the other, you know, that brings up another question, too, is why would someone want to practice lucid dreaming? Aside from the fact that it's fun, sometimes I'll actually do that because I have a question that I want to find an answer to that just seems elusive, and I'm looking for some guidance. And I can ask these questions in a dream, and sometimes I'll be guided to an answer, sometimes I'll be shown some symbols, and, you know, so that kind of lends itself now to the dream interpretation. I know that a lot of people, you know, want to find out about the dreams that come to them. But also for lucid dreamers, that's a lot of what we do too, is we try to interpret the imagery that we ask for. So either way, dream interpretation is probably the next thing that we can talk about too, is symbols and, and, and things that happen. What do you usually do for interpretation? So. My interest in interpretation came because like you, I had a lot of nightmares or very active dreams. And I've been very interested in symbolism and symbology for a very long time, not formally studied, certainly self-taught. But in fact, I teach a class on symbols and interpreting symbols, not just for dreams, but dreams, the symbols that you have in dreams are going to, for most people, correspond to symbols that they have for their waking life. So first of all, there's custom dream interpretation, which means either you do it or you go to somebody to have them interpret it. Or there are the dream dictionaries and universal symbols. And I think differentiating between the two is really important because what you're going to get in a dream dictionary is very similar to like somebody reading tea leaves, that there are these universal symbols. But for some people, like I I tried reading tea leaves and I'm looking at the symbols. It's like, no, that doesn't mean that for me. It doesn't mean that at all, which is why learning your symbols, learning, and for anybody who attended our card class or who gets our card class in the future, that's something that we talk about is learning your symbols. This is so important. The same thing with dreams, get a dream journal, write down to find any patterns. So that's step one, find patterns in your dreams. If you have a reoccurring dream or similar dreams, Mm -hmm. for me, I would have a lot of drowning dreams, floods, drowning, tsunamis. Now I've never been involved in any of that. And I do think some is past life related, but one of my symbols when I'm doing spiritual work with water is what does the water look like? So let's start there. If you dream about water, this is a great simple example of how you can interpret. So for me, calm water, if I'm doing a reading, means that everything is emotionally stable because water usually symbolizes emotions. But rough choppy water or muddy or murky water symbolizes the person's emotions at the time. So let's turn that to you, the dreamer. For you, you're dreaming of muddy water. Now, this is a universal symbol. Water almost universally symbolizes emotions. 
because it's something that we all experience, which is why it's universal. So if you are dreaming of clear, calm water in your dream, then you're probably in a peaceful state. But check your emotions. So if let's say you're looking out over this beautiful, calm lake, but you have worries, what are you worried about in your waking life? What is it that you are worried about that seems good on the surface, much like the calm water? So you have to pair what you're seeing in the dream with your emotions. What are you feeling? The other question is, who are you in the dream? Sometimes a character that pops up in your dream that doesn't look anything like you is actually you. You're trying to figure out yourself from an outside perspective. So just because you are looking at the dream through your own eyes, if you're getting a visual dream, doesn't necessarily mean that you're the person behind the camera, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. So oftentimes, now I'm very clearly female, but oftentimes I'll be going through a dream and there's a male character that's coming up and I'm calling them characters because really it, it is kind of a story that's happening in our mind. There's a male character, but then when I stop and I analyze, okay, what was this character doing? What was their role in relation to everyone else or everything else? I was like, oh, wait, that was me. Mm -hmm. Dreams where you are unable to save someone. That's a very common dream. And that a lot of people, I have people who come to me for dream interpretations you know, and so I have them lay out like, what are the characters? So if you're journaling, write out who are the main players? Who are the side players? What was your emotions in relation to those people? What were they doing? And as you kind of start breaking down the storyline, much like an author would or a movie critic, um, you can take a step back and you can say, okay, where in my waking life does this apply? So when I have money troubles, I have sniper dreams. Like people are coming to get me. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously I'm not in a field, knock on wood, where there's snipers, <laughs> knock on many pieces of wood here. But what is that really symbolizing? It symbolizes that I feel like people are in pursuit of me. Well, they are, they're in pursuit of my money. And being a Taurus, th that might as well be the same thing. Like, because we want stability, we want safety, we want comfort, certainly not. And I've seen like the little red dots, like the laser pointer things I'm like, ugh, ugh. but I've also been in similar dreams or similar time periods being chased by wild animals. Mm -hmm. So like being pursued, being chased, being gone after, and there's a feeling of worry. So again, going back to the emotions, there's a feeling of worry. There's a feeling of lack of control. Half of the nightmares are about lack of control. So you stop and you say, where am I feeling out of control in my life? Is it your health? Is it your money? Is it your relationships? Is it work? And then in order to have that nightmare go away and not keep happening, stop, see what changes you can make in your regular life. If you are having money trouble, stop and say, okay, where can I either cut down my expenses or where can I bring in more money or what bills are the easiest to pay down and pay those down first and right away. Mm -hmm. So this way you're easing some of the trouble. You're taking active steps to eliminate the nightmare. So this is a very practical way of looking at something that could be metaphysical. Now, you were talking about attacks. I've had psychic attacks in my dreams. Mm -hmm. I knew who they were. How did I take control of it? I woke up, not in a lucid way like you're describing, but when I woke up, I knew exactly who it was. I immediately put up protection, cleansed my space, and I took control back of the situation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to do this a few times, keep your space cleansed, especially for those out there who are spiritual workers, for those who are ghost hunters or, you know, paranormal investigators, keep yourself, your space cleansed, cleanse your equipment. We cannot say this enough because it absolutely will come to you. If not in waking life, then in dream life. Mm -hmm. So 
dream interpretation, is it worth it to pay somebody to do it? Yeah, if they're really good at it. But if they're using basically a dream dictionary, do it yourself. Like I said, take a journal, find the patterns. If you get a symbol or a color constantly, ask yourself in three to 10 words, what does this mean? So if you're constantly seeing green, what does green mean to you? First few words that come out of your mouth, write them down. Because that is going to lead you. You have to be like a detective and break down the pieces of this mystery because you're basically solving your inner mystery, the mystery of your inner world. Mm -hmm. And when you break down the characters, the plot and the emotions and the symbolism, that combination will 95% of the time, maybe 90 for some, help you to figure out why you're having the dreams you're dreaming. Now, if they're good dreams, well, keep it up. If you're constantly having nightmares and everything is honky-dory in your world, but you're watching a ton of like horror movies, perhaps watch them in the daytime and not at night. (laughs) So there are some like practical reasons. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, if I wake up from a bad dream, I might go to YouTube and watch like videos about cute little animals, Mm -hmm. you know, because it just kind of puts my mind in a whole different space. So going back to symbols and patterns, those are great to know because sometimes in our day-to-day life, it's hard to see the forest for the trees. We might be going through a stressful situation and not know it because we're so busy. So once you know these patterns and symbols, when you do see them in your sleep, it might be time to reevaluate what you're doing. You talked about control and feeling out of control. For me, my symbolism for being out of control is an elevator. Mm. I'll get on an elevator. I'll press the floor I want to go to. And that thing is like the elevator on Willy Wonka. It will go (laughs) up ways and sideways and down ways and long ways. Like it will shoot straight up and I can't stop it. And it's like, you know, so anytime I have an elevator nightmare, I think, oh, something's out of control in real life. And like I said, sometimes you're just so busy. You're in a routine day to day. Sometimes you don't even realize sometimes when you're feeling out of control or stressed out because you're kind of just on autopilot. So these symbols and patterns can actually help you to find these things in real life. Yes. Another common pattern and symbol that I get are stairwells. Uh, When I'm working on projects and I'm getting closer to the top and getting some success in my dreams, there'll actually be a gap in the stairway and I can't get to the next level and I start, I'm afraid of heights in real life. So I start freaking out because I can't get to that next level. I have to take that, that leap of faith. And so even that presents itself in my dreams too. So anytime there's an elevator or a stairwell, that's when I have to start paying attention to what's going on during my waking time and and things that I have to focus on. For me, it's the tsunami and flooding that's my out of control symbol, not like the calm water, but it means that there's a force that I cannot control Mm -hmm. because you cannot control tsunami. You can't stop a flood. It's going to do what it's going to do. The best you can do is get yourself out of the way. Mm -hmm. And the saving others dream, you know, when I'm trying to save somebody else or take care of somebody else and I'm unable to Mm -hmm. frequently, it's my dog. (laughs) Something's happening to my dog. Like he kept leaving the apartment in Paris was like, what is happening? Ooh, during the pandemic working from home, I kept having like invasion dreams as in people were coming into my house from every direction at one point, it almost looked like the zombie apocalypse from the outside. I mean, they didn't look that way, but just mass amount of people trying to come in my back door. My front door kept being open. I'm like, and it took me like three or four weeks of having this dream over and over to go, oh my gosh, all of these people's energy are in my home in a way that has never been done before on such a mass scale. And for so long, my home space was literally being invaded by all the people that I work with on a daily basis, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. So those were another few symbols is like the invasions, the chasing, the, oh, here's one. I don't think we even put it on our list, but it should be, it should be touched upon. No, no pun intended. Mm-hmm. But you know, the romantic dreams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yep. you know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. <laughs> uh, we're about to get a little spicy here. No. <laughs> 
those dreams where you are being intimate with somebody and you wake up, you're like, why did I dream about that person? Right. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, <laughs> oh, that makes sense. And other times you're like, hold up. <laughs> yeah. There, there are times where you're like, no, 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 I don't want to wake up. Oh, why did you wake me up? <laughs> but those dreams, when you are dreaming about somebody that you would never in waking life ever be attracted to, and you're being intimate with them, ask yourself, and this is going to get a little meta here, not to infringe on copyright, but there's other other places where meta is used. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is when you are actually dreaming about being intimate with yourself, but not in that way. It's this is a time or this is a person that is a reflection of yourself and you're needing to basically get to know yourself better, that there might be an aspect of yourself that you are in waking life. Maybe you're putting yourself down Mm -hmm. and this person is a reflection of that, or you might be thinking badly about yourself. Ask yourself, how do I need to speak nicer to myself? How do I need to love myself more and not in a spicy way? That is a topic for Visit with Spirit After Dark. Yeah, that's um, a whole per- different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps a Patreon only, wink, wink, oh, nudge, nudge. yeah. Um, <laughs> we can get spicier there. But it's you loving yourself, becoming acquainted with yourself, coming to terms with and to peace with those imperfections that you're constantly on yourself about. That can happen when it's like, Oh, why, why am I, was, why did I dream about that? You're not dreaming about them. Mm -hmm. Dreaming about some aspect of them that you're trying to come to terms with about yourself. Very well said. Thank you. Most of the time, it's not, this is not a hundred percent in terms of symbol. That's why you have to use all the other things, the emotions, the symbols, the patterns. And we're going to lead this into the next topic, which is visitation. Most people have had some sort of visitation. And when we say visitation, we mean a spirit, a loved one, a connection from the other side, could be angels, guides, even pets can come visit you in dreams. So Lisa, would you like to expand on a dream versus a visitation? What has been your experience? Because again, this is all very personal. So for me, there's different ways that I can tell if it's a visitation or if it's just subconscious junk. There's been times where I've dreamt about someone who's passed. And again, it's one of those everyday mundane dreams where we might be just having a conversation or we might might even be fighting if we had some unresolved issues in real life where we're working oh, yes. through those. So like I said, those I can kind of, I can tell that that's subconscious junk because when I wake up, I don't really think about it too much. I think, oh, that was, you know, a bummer of a dream or, oh, that was, that was nice, you know, depending on, on how it goes. But visitations are so much more, they're they're different. They're, they're much more vivid. They're almost bright for me. They're very emotional. Like I almost feel a little bit floaty. Like I feel Mm -hmm. like I might be having an out of body experience, but I'm not entirely sure. And there's a connection and it feels like they're really there. Like there's just another level of, it's just like a next level of dreaming. Like it it goes beyond the imagery. It goes to physical sensations. It goes to emotional states and it goes through like, it's just like you wake up and you're so like, you're so grateful that they even, they came, they came to see you. Like your whole day is just brighter and you just think about it all day long. For me, it's almost like all of that, all of that. But to add to what you said, it almost is like the difference between watching a movie and being in the movie. Yes. Yep. I would say you summed it up perfectly. It is, it's much more vivid. The emotions are wildly heightened. Mm -hmm. A visitation when you wake up is not going to disappear immediately. A dream you usually start forgetting within the first like 10 seconds of waking up. I I forget the exact numbers, but mm. it starts to melt away and disappear from your conscious almost immediately where a visitation can last 
sometimes for some people, a lifetime I've heard, you know, they're remembering dreams that they had or visitations rather that they had as a child. Now there are some dream dreams that I've had that I can remember because they were so wildly out of the ordinary that I've remembered most of my life, uh, especially the prophetic ones. In fact, I'm actually, there's a prophetic one that I'm seeing coming to fruition now that I had back around the time of 2001. If you remember that very important time, I had had a dream about two major countries joining forces. I'm not going to, I'm not going to name them here, but all of you can pretty much read between the lines there. And I remember in the dream, I was looking out my backyard at my, in my family home. And I saw these like two invaders, like on the periphery and they were either animals or people. Like it was not like, Oh, flag flag. It's not how it appeared in the dream, but in my mind, I knew. And when I woke up and I can still remember it um, 20 plus years later, and I, I get chills and these two countries working and in cahoots together. So you heard it here first. <laughs> And again, I'm not naming it because I'm not putting that into fruition. I am hoping that wisdom prevails and that peace prevails. Wishing not to go into too much, but wishing all of those who are suffering right now overseas on all ends, wishing them peace, wishing them health, and wishing them a swift end for the highest good of all. Absolutely. Not really where I wanted to go with this, but it was a dream. And I remember being kind of surprised that it didn't come to. But then here we are 20 years later, I was talking about this situation and I went, and it just flashed right back in. I'm like, Mm -hmm. oh no. So this is the one time that I'm hoping my prophetic dreams are wrong. And I'm going to go forth with universe. Feel free to make it wrong all you want. So I think that's another thing to touch upon, too, is a prophetic dream versus a regular dream. And I think those same feelings of a visitation dream where it's bright, it's vivid, it's memorable. Yes. There's a lot of prophetic dreams feel similar to that. Mine usually happen within two to three days if it is going to be prophetic. Yes. I don't want to say I'm on high alert, but I'm, I'm aware, I'm more aware of my surroundings. You know, and sometimes it's just a piece of mail that I'm expecting and I know exactly what day it's going to, and it does. It's like, well, you know, it's a delivery service. It's not that we can track these (laughs) things online, but when we couldn't, I could, I was able Mm -hmm. to do that. But like you said, there's sometimes too where, yeah, something will happen. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you'll remember a dream that you had like decades before. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is exactly the same thing. I've had that happen a few times where, it's not exactly how it happened, but the emotions are there. And all of a sudden, I feel like I'm time traveling a little bit. Mm, yes. I get a little dizzy. I get a little disconnected. And I, I feel the feelings. And I remember the dream. And it's almost the same situation, but it, but it really isn't. And then like two or three seconds later, it's gone. So it's really weird how a certain situation will trigger a memory of a dream years before. And there's this weird, like... Deja vu? Yeah, same thing, where it all tries to tie together. Deja vu, though, is is different for me. Like, if that doesn't usually happen in a dream, that will actually just happen. And I'll know the next two or three seconds what's going to happen, and it does. And it's really, like, it is a very small snippet of time. It's like two or three seconds where one event will trigger it, and I'll go, oh, this is coming next, and it does. And then after that, it's gone. And then I can't tell what's happening after that. That is a topic that if some of you would like to hear about next season, go to our socials, connect with us. You know, so if you want to hear our thoughts and experiences with Deja Vu, maybe even a guest or two. So if you are somebody who's had some extraordinary Deja Vu experiences, connect with us. What you're describing with the prophetic dreams, it's, it's almost, again, it's akin to the Deja Vu experience. Not the same, but like, you know. Like cousins. Yeah, it's that same like <laughs> disconnected feeling for a few seconds and then you you snap right back into reality. Yes. It's very bizarre. So uh, we could go on 
for hours about this. I love this stuff. So I have a lot of heavy Pisces placements. Yes. I have a Pisces moon, Pisces rising, Pisces south node. So for me, it's like the dream world is like, I love it there. It's your jam. It is my jam. It's it's a fun thing. Like I said, I love lucid dreaming. If I have time on the weekends, like I will sleep like a teenager, like 10 hours just so I can have have some fun in dreamland while I'm there a little bit too. And explore around and, and find fun things and meet fun people and it's pretty cool so i could talk about this and i have for you know for hours you know and if this is something that you would like to experience or listen to more again connect with us contact us let us know write to us if, if it's something that you know maybe you're an expert in something or you've had prophetic dreams that have come true you know, do reach out because we are always looking for great guests and we're always looking for new people to connect with. And I am just, oh, I'm excited to wrap up another incredible episode. This was so much fun. This was a lot of fun. Folks, thanks so much for joining us today for another episode of Visit with Spirit. And until next time, may love and light surround you and your loved ones. Thank you for joining us today for our Visit with Spirit. We hope you enjoyed listening. If you have any questions or comments or would like to be a guest on our show, email us at visitwithspirit at gmail.com or find us on social media. Until next time, may love and light surround you and come back again to Visit With Spirit.